Well, we should get started. Um, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining us and expressing interest in Yale uh, SOM. Uh, first of all, I hope that you are all staying safe and healthy uh, wherever you are quarantining or having this lockdown in these like crazy times. Uh, but, but thank you for making time to, to join us here. Uh, my name is Alejandro Alonso. I am from Mexico and with some of the panelists here, I am one of the co-leaders of Out of Office, the LGBTQ uh, plus group affinity club, club and here at Yale SOM. And I also serve here at Yale SOM as, uh, as a student life coacher, uh, trying to build community along like organizing some events and, and parties here. And also I am part of like many other clubs here, here um, like hockey club, DNI club, consulting club, etc. Um, here during my time at Yale SOM, just to give you a little bit of my background, uh, as I mentioned, I am from Mexico and my background is uh, as a chemical engineer. I was part of, um, of building packaging, designing and manufacturing packaging for consumer goods companies. And I came here and now I'm transitioning to consulting. So that's, that's alongside my, my experience. I was working before here, like uh, around five, five years before coming here. Um, again, I introduce myself. My name is Alejandro Alonso. I go by the pronouns he, him, his. And I'm gonna ask all of the panelists here to introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about themselves. Uh, in the meantime, while they're introducing themselves, please feel free to pose some of the questions using either the Q&A panel here or you can chat the, the questions directly to Yale SOM admissions. Uh, if you don't want to use the, the, this through Zoom, you can email them directly. Uh, so, so yeah, for that, like I'm going to ask uh, Alexandra first, please, if you can introduce yourself and tell us a little bit more about you. And also, if you can address why Yale SOM, of course. OK, thanks for the intro, Alejandro. Uh, so I'm Alexandra. I use she, her, hers. Prior to SOM, I worked in investment management for about five years, uh, most recently at a university endowment, and prior to that, a fund of hedge funds. Um, I came to business school because I wanted to cross over into the impact investing space. So last summer, I interned in development finance, and I plan to continue with that work um, after graduation. Besides out of office, I am also involved in Title IX and the Impact Investing Club at SOM. Um, in my spare time, I've done two research assistant positions at the Program on Social Enterprise in the International Center for Finance, and I've also done a few internships um, while I've been here. So happy to speak to any of those things as well. Um, I chose SOM primarily because of the legacy of sending students into impact investing. I think, honestly, with a lot of top business schools, a lot of the programming is becoming more and more similar. But the thing that distinguished SOM for me was the alumni network. When I saw where people were going to going into the um, going into jobs after they graduated, there was really just no comparison across schools. Um, and so, even for schools that have built out really impressive social enterprise programs, it will take years to catch up. And so, for me, it just made a lot more sense from a professional perspective. Giovanni, can you go? Please. Yes, of course. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Giovanni. I'm a second year MBA student. I go by he, him, his. Um, I am originally from Puerto Rico, but I lived in California, Texas for a few years before coming to school. Um, I worked, first started my career as an engineer working in food manufacturing and then transitioned to nonprofit fundraising. Um, and I worked at at a nonprofit for four years before coming to school and um, interned uh, at a foundation over the summer and I'm going into nonprofit consulting after school. So very much in the social sector. Um, and that's primarily a reason why I chose to come to Yale so on. Um, we do tend to attract a lot of people who come with that background, but even, even if they're not thinking about pursuing that as a career, I feel like people generally understand the importance of society and the importance of us contributing to society more broadly. And that was something that was very, very appealing to me. Thank you, Gio. Uh, Ian, can you share us a little bit more about yourself, please? Hi, everyone. I'm Ian. I use he, him, his. Uh, before SOM, I worked for seven years in architecture and urban design, uh, mostly with urban and municipal clients on master plans. And I came to business school to focus um, 
on urban development, specifically in the mobility or digital infrastructure and gov tech spaces. Um, since I've been here, I've been a consultant for small businesses in New Haven. That is a program run through Yale and a community development group. Um, I um, co-organized the Economic Development Symposiums Conference this year with a whole group of students. Um, and I also research um, bankruptcy and small business relief for uh, the New Localism, which is an advocacy group that has jumped um, into action in response to COVID. Um, why SOM? You know, like Alex, I was really attracted by the alumni. A lot of people who graduate from this school go back and forth between the public and private sectors. Um, but the school also, the business school is very integrated into the greater university. So since I've been here, I've spent a lot of time in the L Architecture School. Um, I'm involved in an interdisciplinary urban studies group. Um, I have friends all across the graduate schools, and I think that um, aspect of the institution is what made it my top school. Yes. Thank you, Ian. And of course, David. Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is David. Um, I'm originally from New York City, and prior to SOM, I worked in uh, diversified financial services and the agriculture sector, most recently doing sales and trading, working with commodities, not the most exciting work. Um, I decided to go to SOM to pivot out of that um, and mostly thinking about just, you know, my heavy finance background, I really wanted to find a way to combine my passion for education and just more, um, a lot of more social issues that I feel like I wasn't able to touch upon um, in my previous work. So SOM seemed like a great place to combine those interests, you know, finding the intersection of business and society. And in addition to that, I just encountered the most positive and welcoming people during my um, application recruiting process at SOM. Even before submitting my application, I had a number of people um, who were kind enough to offer to review my application, read essays. And even when I got invited to interview, I think I had perhaps six mock interviews between um, out of office, ALAS, which is our association uh, for Hispanic Latin American students and the consortium. Um, so just throughout the whole process, I could tell that the community was really interested in getting um, like-minded individuals inside and just trying to help out and help people succeed. Um, in addition to that, at SOM so far the past year, um, I'm also a co-lead for Out of Office and a co-lead for First Movers Advantage, which is our dance club here at SOM. So if anyone has questions about dance at SOM, I'm a great person to talk to. Um, in addition to that, I'm also a part of student government along with Alejandro. I'm the marketing communications rep. So trying to find a way to gather all the um, input that students have on campus and trying to find a way to just consolidate uh, opinions and find a way for student government to address um, the needs of the students. So that's a little bit about me um, and my preferred pronouns are he, him, his. Thank you, thank you, David. Um, please, uh, just a reminder that you can all share your questions through either the Q&A panel or directly to chat to Yale SOM admissions, and we're going to be addressing it here. If we don't have enough time to address all of the questions, we're going to have, uh, you can contact us directly. We're going to share our contacts at the end, uh, both the out of office contact or also our personal contacts if you have a personal question around, around this and around the community. And also, I want to take advantage of this opportunity to also share my why SOM, uh, why did I came here? Uh, to like, as echoing as most of everyone said, like, of course, big part of my decision comes from business and society, the mission of the school, uh, looking to explore that intersection. But for me, honestly, the community here, as David says, I think was one of the most welcoming. And that has to do a lot with the city of New Haven being close to a big city, but also being a small city that allows you to have an interaction, a much more close tight community with all your classmates. Like most of my classmates live in a one mile radius from here. So that's really cool, like for like to build that community throughout these two years. So being said that, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and go with the first question, which is how is out of office engaging uh, people through online options in the current COVID-19 situation? Of course, the first question had to do with the current situation of COVID. <laughs> you cannot escape from that. Um, so if anyone wants to share something about, around this. 
I think, um, well, Gio, you, you had like something. Yeah, I'm happy to, I'm happy to share. Um, I think to be completely transparent, we're still trying to figure out what's the best way to engage with folks. Um, just to give you an idea of how the club usually runs, um, we are a closed membership group. So people sign in into, into out of office, but it's kind of like our private sort of community within s one And usually we communicate over a private Slack channel. So that has been pretty active since this sort of new situation happened. Uh, but I would say we had big plans. We had a Pride Week coming up right after the break. It was going to be a series of a lot of events taking over the school pretty much. And obviously all of that got canceled. And I think we're still trying to figure out which of the events that we were going to host um, are still appropriate to host virtually. And I think as people are still trying to figure out their new classes via Zoom and how they engage with others, uh, we haven't done that many events just yet, but it's something that we are in the process of figuring out. And we definitely want to make sure that people understand that we're here to connect with one another in whatever way seems right for people, given, given the, the current situation. But it's something that we, we haven't quite figured out because everybody's kind of like figuring it out as we go. This is obviously a situation that nobody, nobody was really expecting. It's a great question though. Yeah. We'll say we did one happy hour a couple weeks ago that was in place of the closing bell that we were going to have during Pride Week. And it was a pretty small group, but it was nice to be able to check in um, with people that did elect to um, engage that way. So um, I think that's definitely an area that we could continue um, to explore. Um, I have another here, an interesting question that we were talking about uh, community here. Uh, so how does a broader LGBT community connect with out of office, both inside Yale and outside Yale? So that's, I thought that was interesting. <laughs> if anyone wants to jump in here or if I can jump in from my personal Perfect. experience. So there's, you know, out of office and SOM, but there also is a LGBTQ center for all of Yale that does programming for the undergrads and the graduate students, sometimes together, and but more often separately. And I've made a lot of friends through that group. Um, and it's, it's, it's just wonderful. Um, you know, be it from like a, they have like a whiskey and honey tasting to a talk to, you know, an, a, a political engagement um, effort for local New Haven politics. It, it kind of really runs the gamut. And then in terms of New Haven, um, the interactions are a little bit more limited, but I would say the most common resource in my experience as a student here has been Partners, which is um, a very kind of accepting intersectional queer bar in New Haven that I feel like all of us go to all of the time. <laughs> yeah, and I can add on to that. So. Sorry. No, no, please uh, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to mention that earlier this year, before the whole um, COVID situation happened, we actually had an opportunity to put together a cross wide Yale um, LGBTQ club mixer, which was pretty awesome. And, you know, a lot, I would say that all the different clubs from the different schools are very willing and we got a pretty good turnout. It wasn't even hosted by SOM. It was held at the architecture school, which was beautiful. So there are definitely opportunities for just these different clubs at Yale wide to interact and mix. Um, similar to what Ian mentioned at the LGBT Resource Center, you know, not only are there opportunities to socialize, but there's opportunities to volunteer for the community. So um, Giovanni and myself um, serve as mentors for the undergrad um, community. And um, there's just different ways to get involved uh, around New Haven and just Yale on campus through the center. Um, so we also have, uh, do you want to add something, Giovanni? Yeah, um, I just wanted to answer a question on the chat that I think it's easier to answer, um, you know, talking Directly. as opposed to typing. <laughs> yeah, so I'm just going to take over real quick. Um, but yeah, when I say that we are a close membership group, and I think that's good to know because each school has a different sort of environment and how they run their clubs as it relates to LGBTQ, uh, people in their school is very different. But for us, we have a closed membership group, which means that when people, especially when they apply to school, they have the option to select whether or not they identify as LGBTQ in their application. Then admissions, 
uh, shares that with the, the club leaders only in a private way. And then we reach out to everyone individually, privately again, and we ask whether they want to join out of office. This is what we do and why you know they should join. And if they decide to join, then we ask them to a private Slack channel, which is our main way of communicating. Um, so we keep our group quote unquote closed in a way because we want one of our, the parts of our mission as out of office is to ensure that LGBTQ people in SOM find a way to connect with one another and, you know, speak about issues that pertain to our community and kind of like, again, build rapport. Um, and we, in addition to ensure that everybody's privacy is kept and that we're ensuring that we're keeping confidentiality as everyone is at a different part of their journey and feels different differently in terms of how open they want to be. Um, we just keep, keep real pride in ensuring that we are a closed group. That being said, um, a, a big part of our events are pretty much external facing. So we do a lot of events that engage the broader SOM community. So engaging in topics uh, around like LGBTQ issues in the workplace or um, how like our ex lived experience going through the world and you know the side of it we live in and and how to build better allies and all of those events are open to the entire SOM community and that's the way that we engage with allies and that we build that allyship but we also have a way to just like get together as a group within ourselves and we we believe that it's really important to have that space um, especially moving into a new city that you might not know you know uh, where where to find that that sense of community? Nice. And and kind of related to that, Giovanni, I wanna I wanna address one question that I that I think it's pretty important as many of you experienced too. Uh, how was the transition from a big city in a big LGBTQ accepting community uh, to like actually New Haven being a small city and like yeah, no, being being a much more smaller community. If, if someone like who, who experienced that transition uh, want to address this from a big city, uh, I think I'm looking at you, Ian. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so coming from New York, you know, I mean, my experience is definitely colored. You know, I'm like a gay man, so it's like easy to, at least easy enough for me to move from New York to New Haven. Um, I've never felt unsafe walking around in New Haven. Um, I, what, what, actually, I found it to be delightful. I, I mentioned partners because I find spaces like that bar in New Haven to actually be far more um, inclusive. So often you go there and there are like tons of different types of people, different um, gender and sexuality presentations. And that actually wasn't my experience in New York. Um, all, it, particularly like in like bars. Um, I found the SOM community to be like truly welcoming. I've, I've, I personally have not had an issue, um, although there certainly are debates. Um, and I think opportunities like the Graduate Center that um, everyone has mentioned, like really do a lot to foster um, connections, communities, and there are ways to get involved in so many different um, types of activities, be it political, be it health, be it um, kind of like, you know, heart to heart conversations or just like a fun time. And I've not felt deprived in any way. Awesome. Thank you. Does anyone want to add up something to that? Okay. Okay, then. Then I'm gonna go like to a series of questions like uh, that that I've been seeing that there's a lot of submissions around recruiting and networking as part of out of office and the LGBTQ plus community. So, uh, what kind of recruiting and career opportunities are there for LGBTQ plus students here at Yale? So, Alejandro, you might be the only one that went to Ramba. <laughs> Actually. <laughs> No, actually, sorry. David, too. Oh, sorry, David. <laughs> yeah. But, well, one of those is Romba, which we can address uh, We can address directly. Romba, if, if you don't know, is reaching out MBA. And it's a great network of, of queer students among all the MBAs in the United States. 
and there is a an ex like a a reunion like a, a conference happening every around October that that brings all the students all the self identified LGBTQ plus students of all the, the country there and have a bunch of networking opportunities there. Uh, it's a really yeah. cool cool weekend though. But if someone has a better way to introduce it, <laughs> I would I'm happy, appreciate. I'm happy to add. I'm happy to add. I think Rumba, yeah, it's a great way to network with other LGBTQ students across different top programs, like MBA programs in the, in the U.S. But it's also a great opportunity to connect with with recruiters. And I think it's really we see it as a very important opportunity because recruiters go to that conference solely looking for LGBTQ talent. And that is very rare, I think, yeah. in any other setting. So uh, because they only go specifically for that type of talent, um, I think it's, uh, you know, I hope that I definitely will speak for myself. Like you feel very comfortable, you know, sharing about like your partner and like your life because like they know who you are and why you're there. And yeah. I think that that takes a little bit of the pressure away. I'll speak again for myself. Um, and I, I would say that in terms of out of office outside of rumba which is definitely our biggest kind of like recruiting yeah. event um and we we don't put it together we just put together a group to go to this national conference but outside of that um i would say that there's a lot of companies that reach out to our club specifically doing lgbtq events whether it is a networking session you know like a happy hour or whether it is a webinar um, whatever the event is um, they they do use out of office as a filter to get to our members because obviously they don't know you know who belongs to the club and really nobody does unless you're in the club. So they reach out to us and then we kind of share that again across our, our Slack channel to ensure that our members get access to those events that are particularly for LGBTQ talent because it's I think it's very important to have those spaces um, and have the opportunity to network and get in front of employers that are looking for that that sort of that. That type of talent. Sure. Um, I'll just add one more thing to that. So, in addition to Ramba and just out of office, um, I think just speaking to Ian and Alex's point from earlier, the <laughs> alumni really play a huge role. At least they did for me in recruiting. Um, I recruited for consulting, and I would say I, I spoke to at least one out of office alum for each firm that um, I recruited for. And the internship I ended up securing, I would attribute a large part to both attending Ramba and uh, interacting with the company. I'm going to be interning with, but also speaking to a number of alum from SLM and out of office who are very kind and open to helping me out throughout the entire process. I agree. And, and I want to add up to that too, the fact that given that we are so close to New York, we have, we're given access and we have invitations to much many like, networking events, either with alumni and with the firms that they grew up with together to New York. And it's a very accessible trip. Um, okay. So uh, I want to add up another question. Well, no, you practically covered David around alumni engagement with, with out of office members. Thank you. But uh, well, can you talk a little bit about that, Giovanni, of the panel that, that the alumni, that the alumni of uh, out of office alumni are trying to? Yeah. So this year, um, the community inclusion team at NSRM kind of piloted, and some other teams actually, Pat piloted um, a like admissions advisors quote uh, initiative, I guess is the better way to put it, where they uh, matched affinity clubs with alumni who were interested in giving back to the school who identify as, you know, in our case, LGBTQ. So we actually got paired up with five alumni advisors and they're all, you know, working, you know, in tech, consulting, nonprofit, all the different firms. And um, they are very willing to help. We were going to do an event and then with COVID-19, we're still trying to figure out what's the best way to engage them in a, in a panel that's more virtual. But um, I would say that so far, it's been great to see how they are, like how alumni are so interested in giving back, particularly LGBTQ alumni who, um, you know, want to give back to, to out of office and to the broader community. And it's been really, really refreshing to see and to be able to interact with them. Awesome. Um, also, it, it is important to mention that that co-founder of Rumba, he was actually ISOM alum, right? James Robertson. Correct. And so, so he has a very tight, uh, tight school. 
Um, okay, so we also have a question around how does the school engage in dialogue with out of office? And for here, I wanna I wanna put on both like the administration and the broader community. I would say. So there's a handful of events that we host that are meant to be a forum to engage with the broader SOM community. And sometimes that includes both students and staff. So an example of that would be the coming out monologues, which is where a handful of members of our community um, talk about a time that they came out. And sometimes it's the story of how that happened. And sometimes it's more of a reflection. So we try to do that once a year. And that, while it's not a dialogue between the individual and the audience, it's meant to create space to have those conversations organically um, outside of the classroom. Um, and so we do a few things along those lines. As far as engaging with staff, um, we sit on the Community and Inclusion Committee of Student Government. And so that's one way that we can bring our concerns, but also hear about what, what other affinity groups um, are discussing. Anytime that I've had to engage with the administration for any particular reason, whether it's concern about an individual student, something that they're going through, um, or if it's a broader concern within the out of office community, I've been very intentional about the people that I seek out as well as the way I approach those conversations. And I've had a really positive experience. I know that there are other issues that, um, you know, have brought up greater debates within our community, but um, I have felt at least a willingness to have those conversations. Um, and so that's something that I've really valued from my experience here. Thank you. Um, okay, and, and going from this, uh, what is most what is most meaningful for you as member or co-leader of out of office? And I would love to go through each one of you to say something that you have found meaningful of being a member of this. Whoever wants to go first. <laughs> I can go first. Um, I would just say the, the willingness and openness to engage. I feel like I've never experienced any kind of tension in this club. You know, um, I feel like, you know, when you think about SOM, you know, there are certain classes and, and certain just events that could create like tense conversations. But I do feel like out of office, you know, there's this form of human unity. Like I think of in the past few months, just if anyone would suggest like a happy hour or a potluck or some kind of get together, you know, you'll just see people come together. It, you know, like there's, we, we've mentioned a lot of formal events that take place, but I think there's opportunity to just, you know, have informal get togethers. And um, that's something I've really appreciated about out of office thus far. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, the people are just wonderful. Like, I, I just like it. And that goes a long way. Um, I would say I'm really impressed by how inclusive the community is, the, the out of office community is. Many people come um, to Yale as well as the United States more broadly to um, be queer in many different ways. And the club, I think, really accommodates like a broader um, experience and um, set of like rules around privacy for, for those people who can't be you know, like out and you know, on the out of office website. Um, and, and I really respect that about the club. And the, the last piece is it's been very helpful to me in my career goals. I've talked to so many amazing, thoughtful leaders who have come out of this club who have been like wonderful mentors to me. Yeah, I can jump in. I think, um, yeah, I, I agree with, you know, the people are amazing um, and the community itself is amazing, but I would say having the opportunity to <clears throat> co-lead the club I think it's it, there's a lot of growth that I've gained to just like in terms of like understanding how nuanced the community is because you know as a um, as a cisgender male who identifies gay like there's only like a limited perspective that you get and I think being leading a club like out of office which um, which I think you have to be really mindful of people's experiences in SOM and how do they they show up and how do people um, are there to support them and I think it I it has ref resulted in me like reflecting a lot upon my experience and how that's different from others in terms of like the broader LGBTQ community but also how do you be a space in a way that's inclusive um, and that you are 
being held accountable if you say something you shouldn't have said or if you're thinking about uh, an issue in a, in a not really nuanced way. And I think that had I not taken more of a, like a leadership role in the club or, or even being involved in the club at all and getting to know people's different experiences within the spectrum, um, I don't think I would have grown that much. And I'm still obviously in the journey. So. Yeah, I love that. And yeah. I would say that I've had a very similar experience. I actually, when I came to SOM, did not plan on being involved in out of office, not because I didn't care about it, but I just felt like, okay, I've checked the box under diversity. And that doesn't necessarily mean that I inherently have anything in common um, with the club. So when I came here, I was all about business. I just wanted to, you know, my career path and, and that would be it. And I became friends with several members of out of office during my first year. And so it kind of happened. Um, and then when I thought about taking on a leadership role, I talked to a lot of people that I really trusted because I wasn't sure that my experience was representative of the community and I wasn't sure that I had something to say. But what I've learned from being a leader is that one, I gained a lot of pride in being publicly out and that was really empowering for me. Um, and two, everyone does have something to say. And three, it's an opportunity to learn how to listen and be an ally, even if you identify with the community. So I think not only have I become more prideful, but I've also just become hopefully a, a much stronger ally. And I think that crosses over in other spaces. Totally amazingly agree with whatever like the whatever of you like all of you just said and and i want to add up something too like in, in the same page uh that david kind of touched it like the international aspect of it like many people come from all over the world and it's the first place that they have to be safe so i having that safe space me coming from mexico like i i was already out but definitely i've never had a resource like this and adding up the educational aspect of it has been so enlightening and has created much more uh, better tie, uh, better tie with the community, with the whole community, not just my own experience. Um, okay, so we want also address now a little bit. We're gonna change gears here and talk about our application process. So there's a lot of questions here around our experience through application process, both since starting it, then to the interview, and then coming here for the first time. So if we can go through a walkthrough, a small walkthrough of, of that, we will love to, to listen from your perspective. Ian, can you just start with this? So the questions about like- how Application process. Application? Like how was the application process for you specifically? Compared oh, with it, it was it was long. Um, yeah, the application process sucks. I don't know what else to say. Um, um, one thing that I, if if you want advice, like please reach out to me, um, or I would hope also that my fellow panelists, like I believe in generosity and reciprocity. Like I'm here to help. Um, I'll read an essay. I'll brainstorm. I'll help you interview talk candidly about other schools, wh wh whatever you need. Um, I think for me, I approached it as like a very sincere activity around like what my life goals were. And one piece of advice I would give myself would have been to have been like a little more targeted, not, not, not to, to lie ever, but just to like really spell out a very concrete, um, professionally driven, um, essay and application, because I think that's ultimately what lands uh, most convincingly in the um, admissions committee's, um, you know, like scope of considerations. Not, not that there aren't other considerations that are happening, obviously, but I think like a really clear, good story goes a long way. Thank you for that. Gio? <laughs> Yeah, sorry, my headphones ran out of battery, so now I'm just going to hold my phone like this. Um, <laughs> the, yeah, the application process, I agree, is pretty long, pretty painful, and I think a lot of it comes down to sort of like, it, it's emotionally draining in some ways, in terms of like thinking like whether you're, you know, you're good enough to get to the schools that you want to get to, and I think it's, 
it is a process that is just hard in a lot of ways. So similarly, I'm here to help in any way I can. But I would say that in terms of advice, I would say, yeah, know yourself, have a, a decent story, but also understand what school is a good fit with the sort of experience that you're going to get. I would agree that most top schools are going to give you a great experience regardless, but the experience is going to look different depending on where you are. And I would say that spend the time to really go to panels like this, talk to students, talk to alumni, visit the school if you can, obviously not in this moment, but eventually when we can fly again, um, and just try to really connect and understand what you're looking for in a school and what schools will provide you with the sort of experience that you are interested in getting and just be really targeted and demonstrate if you find that target school, like really demonstrate interest, talk to people, get yourself known so that you are able to be successful in that, in that process. Thank you. Alexander, you want to share anything about your process, your personal process? I mean, honestly, at this point, it's kind of a blur, which I know is <laughs> helpful. <laughs> I do wish that I had talked to more at the schools that I applied to because when I was deciding between business schools, I actually didn't feel like I knew SOM socially. Um, I didn't get to experience that part of Welcome Weekend. Um, and so what should have been a really exciting decision actually ended up being very stressful because I didn't feel like I knew the school along that dimension. Um, but it worked out very well. Nice. David? Just to finish up. Yeah, um, I agree. It is a very arduous process. Um, my advice would certainly be to be intentional and disciplined about it. it it's, I hate thinking about the year I applied to business schools because it was like GMAT and business schools, and that's all I remember from that year. It, it was a lot. Um, but with that being said, I think it was worth putting all that time in because I think I, I forgot who said it, but. It's true, right? You're going to get a lot out of whatever top program you go to. But I also think it's true that each school does have does have its own personality, you know, and you won't really assess that personality unless you interact with the school in a variety of avenues. Like for me, for example, I was fortunate enough to be a part of um, MLT Management Leadership for Tomorrow. So if anyone's a part of that group and is listening, you know, really take advantage of just, you know, the MLT alum or individuals who are, um, a part of SOM or just other schools and try to get their perspective, you know, in addition to talking to out of office, talk to other groups that you're interested in and just trying to get a more holistic, well-rounded view of the school that you're applying to and see what kind of fit um, the school has for you. Um, in addition to that, um, I think that's, well, actually, I think that's, that's mostly it, right? Just, just making sure that the fit is, is good for you and just being very intentional about the time you put forth and having a well-rounded approach when you're thinking about all the schools you want to apply to. Awesome. I actually have one more thing to say. <laughs> I, have, I have advice, um, which is I would pursue, if I were to do this again, I would pursue the entire act of applying to graduate school as um, like sort of, sort of like a boot camp in, in trying to figure out what it is I want out of life. And the reason being is that like going to business school won't solve your problems. It's not going to give you what you want. And then in fact, when you get here, you don't stop applying to things and you continue to present yourself and write applications and do interviews and you know network and talk. Um, and it's a very exhausting process and self-improvement and learning what's going on in the world and how your skills align and what gaps you have. Um, and I think the application process for me was the beginning of a longer journey in like measuring myself up against what opportunities exist in the world and trying to figure out how I want to connect to them. Um, and so if I were to have begun the application process again, I think I would have realized that regardless of the outcome, the application process is the beginning of understanding like how you want to navigate whatever institutions or businesses you care about. I love that again. That's so true. And um, well, I agree, I echo with all of it. Like it was very, very long process, but it was a very reflective process and introspective process of why do I really want this? And, and at the end, that's, that's, I'm really glad that I did. And I'm really glad that all my fellow panelists did because we are all here. And okay, luckily we all got in, we all here. So now we want to touch a little bit about academics. Um, so 
coming here, what has been your class experience? If anyone, a dual degree, if they can share something, but like overall the class experience here at SOM, how has it developed? David, do you want to share something with your class experience? Sure. Yeah, so I'm not a dual degree, so I can just talk about the single degree experience. Um, well, uh, you know, as a first year, I've pretty much experienced the core, um, which I can say is difficult. <laughs> um, so I'm being quite candid, but I think that's something you'll see across all the schools. I mean, actually, when you think about the idea of a core curriculum, it's, it's hard, right? Because you have individuals who come from uh, perhaps no business experience to people who have CFAs, who have GPAs, and then, you know, you're all in the same class, being graded on the same curve in classes like accounting and economics. But, you know, by the nature of that kind of like difficulty and wide range of knowledge and, and skills, I think SOM does provide supports in place to help kind of um, bridge the gap. So for me, for example, I'll, I'll say that uh, math was not my forte. And I guess that came through my application because I was invited to math camp. <laughs> um, so math camp is pretty much an opportunity for incoming students who um, perhaps just need more uh, assistance and help in that area to kind of go through a boot camp of math for three days before the classes actually start, which I found um, pretty helpful just to kind of get you back into the swing of learning because I do feel like going from working full time and then trying to go back into getting in that student mindset of doing homework and studying and everything isn't the easiest and most seamless transition. So having that opportunity, I think, really helped me get a nice quick little jump start. Um, and in addition to that, there's opportunities to attend review sessions. Um, I thought, which was fascinating, this past quarter, there was like a slow review session and a fast paced review session. So really trying to um, be thoughtful about people who want perhaps maybe like a slower pace versus fast pace. And there was an opportunity to have a tutor. Tutors are pretty much second years or paid to tutor first years, which I definitely took advantage of. I think the first quarter I asked for a tutor for every class that I could. Um, so the resources are there. It is difficult. You have to put um, a lot of work in, especially in the first semester, um, just because it is difficult to manage recruiting and academics at the same time. But the resources are there for you to use. Uh, uh, has anyone taken some electives that they want to talk a little bit about? The electives that you're taking right now. This is mostly for second years, I would say. So, Alexander, can you share some of the electives? Yeah. Are interesting. I always try to have at least one elective that follows the and society part of our uh, mission statement. Last semester, I took a full semester course on urban poverty and economic development. Um, last quarter, I took a class on social mobility and inequality. And right now, I'm in an inclusive economic development lab. Um, and so I like the variety of electives that we're able to take and the richness of the content that those classes have to offer. It's just something that's very different from the finance experience that I'm getting in some of my other elective classes, which is very practical for what I want to do. Um, but this keeps my interest in social impact kind of alive in, a, in an academic way. The other thing that I'll add about classes, just as a broader comment, and I don't want the message to be that grades don't matter, that classes don't matter. They absolutely do. But I really think it's what, it's what you put into it. And so people come to this school for a variety of different reasons, and all of those reasons are valid. For me, um, I use classes as a way to get training in areas of my resume that I feel are incomplete. Um, but I also try to make sure that I have enough space to engage in the types of activities that are meaningful outside of the classroom. And so that's making time for out of office or some of the other clubs that I'm involved in. It's making time for internships or it's making time to be a research assistant. Um, so I think that that's really important. And the advantage to going to business school is that you have flexibility to make the experience what you want it to be. Awesome. Yeah, and, and similar to that, like not just the SOM electives that are being offered by the School of Management. Is anybody here taking classes outside of SOM? Want to share something about it? I'm taking a cross-listed course at Forestry. Um, it's a class on renewable energy project finance. So nice. there are obviously a lot of SOM students that take that class, but there are also a lot of law students. There's some undergrads. Um, there's forestry students. It's kind of nice to be in a classroom 
um, with so much diversity across academic interests. Thank you. And also there's a question here about, do you feel that there is enough support for all students, not just the high achieving students? What do you think, like now that you mentioned, David, that the core was really hard? <laughs> Yeah, um, I mean, I think all the resources I mentioned, I took full use of, uh, right, the review sessions, the tutors, but in addition to that, there are office hours for the professors, but not only for the professors, but the TAs, um, which I think is pretty useful. I, I use TA office hours as well. Um, so, I mean, it's there, right? It, I think something you'll see when you go to business school is just it's a lot about time management. Um, as I mentioned, your first semester is going to be crazy busy. And to Alex's point, it's a matter of what you want to prioritize. You know, perhaps there's a class um, in economics and you majored or minored in econ, so you don't want to put a lot of effort into that because you would rather build out knowledge and skill set in perhaps accounting or perhaps you want to develop a more modeling um, ability and, and, you know, focus more attention there. So it really does come down to the individual, but I do think the resources are in place to help those who perhaps don't have the background to be successful in the class. And um, regarding academics, what has surprised you the most, Ian, for example? Um, well, you know, I come from architecture and the humanities. So like David, I was kind of uh, slapped in the face by the core um, and similarly got a tutor in every class and like really learned a lot. Um, and uh, I think one challenge of the core experience is the amount that you have to produce. Um, you will be very, very busy, um, regardless of what your personal goals are um, in terms of what you want to learn and what the experience means to you and what you're investing in. It's, I, 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 it's just a very busy time. And I think I was a little shocked by how hard it was. Um, and then another hard thing to balance is the amount of activity that's going on in Yale. I came to Yale because it's so integrated, because it's a huge university, it's just such an amazing place. And there's, you, you could just spend your time going to lectures all day long. So there's, there's a lot of time management that comes into being a successful student. And in terms of support for people who maybe are like overwhelmed or anxious or have never experienced an environment like this before, there are so many resources. Um, nice across the university from tutors, uh, mental health counseling, um, other students. It's, I, I think, you know, there, there, there's help there if you can seek it out. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Okay, now I'm gonna address a question that I find like quite funny that I think it's always in the mind when people are applying. Uh, how would you describe the personality of SOM students opposed to other top business schools? If you all can share something, that would be really cool. <laughs> I think students are very introspective and we have very high expectations of ourselves, our peers, and the school. So there's no complacency. If there's discontent on campus, students are gonna rally and figure out a solution. Um, if there's a debate going on, people don't shy away from those conversations. So I, I mean, it's hard to say what that looks like at other schools. I have nothing but good things to say about the other schools that I applied to, um, but I've just been very impressed by the willingness to engage on this campus and also the willingness to reflect and not just call out other people, but actually interrogate um, you know, our own actions and the way that we show up for other people on this campus. Yeah, I agree with that. And I'll just add on to that. Um, just thinking about SOM and obviously like these are all generalizations, you can find a wide variety of personalities at a school, but I do think it's true, the introspective and reflective part, but I do think SOM really does stay true to the and society in that respect, part of the mission. You know, it just makes me think of certain classes where we had uh, arguably contentious discussions. I think of one class in particular, the workforce, where, you know, there was a couple of conversations about diversity and inclusion with case studies uh, in the tech industry. And, you know, you really do get the wide spectrum of opinion but what I do appreciate about um, the classes and the students involved in these discussions was that even once the class was over, there was still a sense of like the conversation wasn't done, right? Like it's not just limited to these class discussions and there's a club um, on campus called Ann Society 
that helps talk about these different topics and discussions. And so basically what Ant Society did was they kind of had like a continuation of um, the conversations that were had in class just because they are important issues. And, you know, these discussions aren't limited just by the one hour and 20 minute class time that we have. They leave the classroom that you can have in the hallways, just with friends, over drinks and et cetera. So to Alex's point, people are very introspective and really willing to engage in discussion and try to understand different people's perspectives. Thank you. Anyone want to add up something about that personality aspect? Okay. Can we? No, tell us, Gio. Okay, it's cool. Quick. Um, real quick, wait. Yeah, I was just going to add that I, I think for me, people here are very caring, and I think we take a lot of pride in taking care of our community and of each other. And I, I feel like I've certainly felt that, you know, I was recruiting for consulting this year, and I've never done it before. And, you know, I had friends like well Alejandro knows because he was like with me when I was like in the midst of recruiting what a pain but um you know like I had friends like spend like three or four hours with me on the phone just going through like a base camp of like how to do case interviews and just like so many people who like just showed up and just like they already had jobs and like they didn't have to do it but just like very willing to put up their times and their resources sending me links to things that I can use and yeah, I just I, I wouldn't be able to do to have done it without them. And I think that's just one example of many, many other examples that I think you can see of how people here step up to help one another. And I think it's really, really nice to see. Thanks. Yes. Um then like in the opposite on the other hand, what would you do to change about the community if you could? Be good. And it's kind of related to a next question of what are we doing or what are you doing to make SOM a better place when you left or when you leave, which is kind of cool, I think. <laughs> Does anyone want to step in here? Or I'm going to call call. <laughs> yeah, it's a deep question. <laughs> but I don't know, Giovanni, can you share us a little bit about yeah, I mean, um, I don't, I don't know if this is an aspect of the community. I think I would say personally, in terms of community, meaning the people, my classmates, I've had a very, very positive experience. I've met incredible people, but in terms of like the SOM experience, I will say that the in academics, there's like two things that for me could be better, and like one of them is I, I wish there would have been much more clear, like clearer if that's a word, um, that about like the sort of like the expectation in terms of like the workload that you're getting yourself into as someone who like came in, not really thinking about academics at all. And then like being like slapped on the face the first week, you know, like have like a million you know, tests and assignments and teamworks and projects. And I wish that, I don't know if that was on me that I didn't like really remember that I was going back to school. It certainly was very, uh, it wasn't a pleasant surprise. And it, it, academics ended up taking a lot more time than I wish it had. Um, and maybe that was on me, but maybe they could be more clear about that, about the expectations. And I think second, I would say that we do have a slightly different kind of like core curriculum with our organizational perspectives, which I think in theory is very, very cool and like innovative, I guess. But in practice, um, some of the courses I think can be improved in terms of how they manage to go from one sort of perspective to the other. Um, most of our courses are taught by two professors in the core at least, and usually they come from very different backgrounds. And I think a lot of professors do a really good job of like passing it from one to the other, from one topic to the other. But some classes are still in the midst of, you know, getting totally fine tuned. And um, I wish that that could be improved. And we do have a system where we give feedback at the end of each class in terms of how the class went. And I know that professors take it very seriously, I, most professors, I'd say. Um, but I would say that um, definitely some improvement that can be done there. Okay. Thank you. Anyone wants to add up something with this? Um, Okay, also, given the constraints of time, uh, I want to do a round of going through each of one of you to share final thoughts. And with those final thoughts, uh, 
one of the things that you wish you knew before applying or while applying to the MBA? So we're going to start with David. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think this has been alluded to or, or spoken to before by uh, the group of us, but I think just making sure you have a plan in place, like once you do get accepted into the business school of choice of, you know, what your priorities really are, because as we've all mentioned, there's going to be things coming at you from every direction, be it academic, be it social, be it professional, and just making sure you kind of know, I think Ian said it, um, like knowing your story and your, your true intentions of why you're going to business school, because it's very easy to get pulled in different directions. And people always talk about the FOMO because, you know, you're going to, you're going to see your friends going to this recruiting event and say, wait, that sounds really cool. It's not what I thought about, but maybe I like this um, or just like different social events. And so just making sure you kind of know yourself, your goals and your priorities um, before you set foot on campus will definitely make your life a lot easier. Uh, yeah. Gio or Ian, sorry. <laughs> Oh, oh, I was just going to um, sort of say a similar thing, which is uh, for anyone who, um, like me, is coming from a non a non traditional in the eyes of a business school background, or maybe has like kind of unusual career goals um, after, meaning you're not going into like a major corporation or a bank or a consulting firm or a huge philanthropic institution. Um, there is, I think, um, a challenge of of, of staying to your path and realizing that there are so many opportunities out there, but you have to find them yourself. Um, there, uh, there's so much money in these major um, sect, like these major companies in terms of recruitment that at first, when I got to business school, it appeared as if like McKinsey and Goldman Sachs and the Robin Hood Foundation were like the only way. And they're not the only way, they just have the most money. Um, and they have, like staffs of HR support to you know fuel a constant supply of MBA interns. And I think it's really challenging, but also really rewarding to stay to your own path, talk to people, get out in the field, um, and kind of through a very circuitous energy intensive process, actually find really cool fits and opportunities. Um, even though those opportunities will not present themselves to you through um, on-campus recruiting and like lecture series that happen. Gio, just final thoughts? Wait. Yeah, I would say, um, I know there's a lot of thinking about, you know, what's next and your career, but I think particularly once you get admitted to school, like when you're in the process, just like put all into it, but also feel free to the summer before you start, just take a step back and just like reconnect with your friends, with your family and like get some rest. I mean, once you start, it's going to be really, I'll speak for myself again, like it can get really intense. And I think it's really good for you to take some time when you can to just connect with yourself and take time for, for yourself to, to be in the mindset and be ready to kind of start this journey. Sandra? I would just say that it's important to recognize that everyone here is smart, we're all highly driven and competitive. There's also a lot of people here who have never failed spectacularly, just fallen on their face. And I, I think business school is a time to experiment because it's not possible if you're dabbling in a lot of different things to be excellent at all of those things in a way that you expect of yourself. You're not going to impress every single professor that you have. And that's okay, because if you're going to fall on your face, you might as well do it here rather than several years down the road when you're well into your career, because at least if you don't meet your standards here, you will always have people to support you and pick you back up. And so I think it's a really important time to practice being okay with not excelling at absolutely everything. Thank you. Thank you all for having the time, for taking the time to be here, the panelists and all the attendees. Uh, they're going to follow up. Admission is going to follow up with our emails. Also, we share the email of the out-of-office club directly there, which that reaches us, Giovanni, Alejandro, and me. If you need the email of David in the end, you can ask us directly. And thank you so much. Uh, we're hoping that you go through all the process okay, okay. And if you have a specific questions, if you're already admitted or wherever, reach out and we are here to help. Thank you all. Bye-bye.